Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel and thanks for joining me again for another lesson. This week we're going to tackle what is probably the most well-known bossa nova tune of all time, Carlos Jobim's The Girl from Ipanema. We'll learn the chords, finger style, for that beautiful traditional bossa nova accompaniment. We'll also learn a simple melody. But the main focus of this lesson really is going to be to gain a good command over your chords with sixes and nines in. For example, major six, major six nine, dominant nine, minor nine, and so on. As always, you can check out the links in the description if you want to get hold of the lesson materials and follow along. If you join my Patreon for a small monthly fee, you'll get access to all of my lesson materials, or you can simply buy this as a one-off purchase via the Gumroad link. I'll leave that up to you. So, let's jump straight in. We're going to learn to play this in its original key of D-flat, as opposed to the key of F, which I know a lot of people play it in nowadays, uh, but we're going to go old school. For our D-flat major chord, our one chord, we're going to opt to play a 6-9 type of chord. As you'll know if you've seen many of my videos, I'm a huge fan of this kind of chord sound. The 6-9 for me is a firm favourite. We're going to root this on the A string, 4th fret, first finger barring the 3rd fret of the D and G, and then the 3rd finger on the 4th fret of the B string. So you've got your root, your 3rd, your 6 and your 9. For our introduction, we're just simply going to hold on to this chord for 4 bars, and apply a good old bossa nova finger picking pattern. Let's break that pattern down. So first of all, the thumb is going to alternate the bass between the root and the fifth of the chord. In this case that's the A string and the low E string. The left hand also has to follow that pattern, so the second finger is switching from the A string to the E string as the bass moves around. The rest of your chord shape stays the same. Now as far as the fingers on the picking hand go, all the way through the song, with no exception, they're going to be responsible for the same three strings. First finger is going to be picking the D string, second finger on the G string, third finger on the B string. And they'll always be picking at the same time together sometimes with the bass as well. So that would be thumb and fingers all at the same time. So for the sake of simplicity, whenever I say fingers, assume that means these three are all picking at the same time on the D, G and B strings. Okay, so the pattern itself is two bars in length. On beat one of the first bar of the pattern, we get the thumb and the fingers all together. So that's everything all at once. And beat two is just the fingers. Beat three is just the thumb on the alternated bass note on the low E string this time. So now you've got one, two, three. Then on the end of three, we get the fingers again. And then on the end of four, we get everything together, thumb and fingers, bass note back where it originally came from on the A string. Sounds complicated. Makes a lot more sense when you see it on the sheet. Okay, so here's the first bar of our pattern. One, two, three, and four, and. And I would recommend just practicing that and keeping count. One, two, three, and four, and one, two, three, four. One, two, three, and four, and one, two, three, four. When it comes to these things, it's all about muscle memory. And you really don't want to rush the data input stage of muscle memory. This is like programming the machine. Don't program it in a rush and don't hurry things because you'll program mistakes in there that you then have to go and unlearn. And before you know it, a few weeks have gone by and you've learned nothing. So I would recommend really doing it slowly, be very patient, and get it correct from the get-go. Now for the second bar of our pattern, we play nothing on beat one. We simply allow the last beat of the previous bar to continue ringing across into this one. Now on the end of one, we pick with the fingers again. And then on the end of two, we pick with the fingers again. And then on beat three, we alternate the bass down to the low E string. And then beat four, it's just the fingers again. So here's the second bar. One and two and three, four. One and two and three, four. One and two and three, four. And again, take your time and program that stuff in patiently and accurately. It's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. The pieces have to make sense on their own first. Okay, now let's have a go at putting that full pattern together. So the full two bars. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, and four. And one, and two, and three, four. One, two, three, and four. And one, and two, and three, four. So that's 
the pattern we're going to default to for about 90% of this piece. There'll be the odd moment where we have to vary it a little, but we'll talk about that when it happens. Okay, now let's get on to learning the rest of the changes. So that intro is just simply four bars of D flat 6 9. So that would sound like this. One, two, three, four. Now we begin the A section. D flat 6 9 for another two bars. Then we move along to E flat 9. So that's an E flat 7. Visualize this three note voicing off the A string. And add the 9 at the sixth fret of the B string. So think of it as an E flat 7 first and foremost, but with the 9 as its upper extension. Still alternating the bass in the same way. And then we're going to make it a minor 9. Now this is where there's real value in knowing where your intervals are within your chord shapes. Knowing that the third is currently occupying the D string means that all you've got to do to make this a minor 9 is drop that down a semitone. Root, flat 3, flat 7 and 9. And we're only going to spend one bar on this chord, which means we're only going to make it halfway through our pattern before we have to move on to the next chord. 1, 2, 3, 4 and. So in fact we're moving to our new chord on the and of 4. And the new chord is a D9, so the same shape we had a semitone higher for the E flat 9 a moment ago. Look at how little movement we've had to do here. From the E flat 9, we then flatten the third, and then we bring everything else down while that first finger stayed where it was. And then we're back to our 1. The D flat 6 9. And this is where the pattern changes for the first time. Again, we're only doing one bar here. 1, 2, 3, and 4. On the and of 4, we're going to move this shape up a semitone, keeping that low E string in the bass, play that on the and of 4, and then on beat 1 of the next bar, play the fingers, and then move the bass note back to the A string, and hit everything together on beat 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2. It's like a turnaround. And all we're doing is taking a D flat 6 9 up a semitone to a D6 9, which is kind of like a tritone substitution for the 5 chord. We're sort of implying a 1 5 kind of movement there D flat to A flat 7. D dominant would be your tritone sub. We're making it a 6 9 type of chord, and it still works pretty much in the same way. We go back to the start of the A section and go around everything again. D flat 6 9, E flat 9, minor 9, D9, D flat 6 9. Stay on it this time. We're not playing a turnaround because we don't want to go around again. Now we go into the B section where we move this D flat up a semitone to D, and we could play just that same kind of chord again, a D6 9. But because I want this lesson to be kind of a thorough overview of many of the different types of chords that have sixes and nines in, I decided we should play a major nine here, which is only one note different from the six nine. Instead of a six, we have a seven. So you've got the root, the three, the seven, and the nine. Two bars there with the usual pattern. And then a G7, two bars there. And then we're going to play a D minor 9, and this is at the 5th fret of the A string. Root, flat 3, flat 7, 9. So again, this is a shape we used earlier, a semitone higher for the E flat minor 9. Two bars here, and then a B flat 7. And then the E flat minor 9. To a B7. So some really interesting chord movement there. This bit often throws people. If you think about the journey we've taken so far in this B section, we had a D major to a G7, a D minor to a B flat 7, an E flat minor to a B7. So we're kind of gradually creeping up the fretboard. Now what comes next is something a little more familiar if you've played a lot of jazz. We do a couple of two fives. F minor 7, B flat 7. 
funky thing here though is we've got the flattened fifth or the sharp 11 in that chord. Think of your three note voicing for a dominant seven rooted on the low E, adding the flat five on the B string. So that's your F minor seven to your B flat seven flat five, and then your E flat minor seven to your A flat seven flat five. So it's just moving down through a cycle of fourths. So you could think of it as a 2-5 in E flat, and then a 2-5 in the home key of D flat. And that will resolve when we start the final A section. One bar of each. Final A section. Very much like the other ones. around on it if you intend to go back to the top of the song and start again. But if not, if you want to end it here, which we're going to do, we're going to do this cool little ending, quite common in this style. It's a lot like that turnaround still, but we just repeat D flat 6 9 to D6 9. You can keep going for quite a while if you wanted. It's good for lead players to jam over this kind of thing, and then gradually let it fizzle out. back on the one. So I'm going to play through the whole thing now with the metronome set to 130 BPM, which is about full speed. Uh, I'm not going to do the ending because it will sound weird slowing things down against a metronome that's ticking away in the background. And also I'm going to record this as I'm doing it into my looper so I can play the melody on top afterwards and we can go through that quickly. I'll include the four bar intro as well. Okay, here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. A section. Second A section. over the top here. Let's get into that melody a little bit. We won't spend too long on it. It's all written out on those sheets for you. Uh, and it's fairly simple, but there's a couple of little pointers I can give you along the way. So the melody starts here on the 9 of 
our D flat 6 9. That's how I remember how this relates to the tonic chord. Makes things easy to move around if you have to change keys. And there's the major 7th and the 6th. So the melody really is built out of these major D flat ingredients 9, 7, and 6. Stays the same on the E flat 9. And then on the E flat minor 9, the flat 7. And then follow that flat 7 down to the D7. And then finish up on the 5th of the 1 chord. Make sure as well that you play this with some freedom and some expression. You know, be kind of loose with your timing, make it sound lyrical and playful. Now the B section is where things get a little more complicated with the melody. Uh, now think about the first chord of the B section, D major 9. And again, this is where it's really useful to relate lead parts to chord shapes so you can remember them quickly. You know, here's my major 9. I'm grabbing this major 7 and using it as a landmark to start my melody. And it's all stuff from a D major scale. And then over the D minor 9, the melody's going to start on the 9. Now it's all stuff from a D minor kind of scale. And then on the E flat minor 9, same thing a fret higher, starting on the 9. Same shape. And then when we go into the F minor 7, we're going to walk up to this minor 3rd from the chord shape. And then drop down an octave. We're kind of following that spicy flat 5 sound from the chord. And then we can be thinking about basically moving that same shape down a whole tone, but tweaking one little thing to keep it within the D flat major scale. But again, we're targeting that flat 5 at the end. F minor 7, B flat 7 with a flat 5, E flat minor 7. A flat 7 with a flat 5, back to the final A section. This melody also works really well in octave form. If you want to bring in a bit of that Wes Montgomery flavour, use the thumb to strike them as well. I'll also include that in the sheet as a variation on the melody. I'd highly recommend listening to a lot of this bossa nova music from the early 60s. Joe Beam was kind of the master of it all. A couple of other standout songs for me would be Desifinado and Aguas de Marco. I'll include a couple of links in the description to some really good versions of those songs. Gear-wise today, it's pretty simple. I'm using my 1958 Gibson ES-175. Recently got this back from a refret, and it sounds and feels absolutely amazing. It was kind of hard to play before the refret, to be honest. Some of the frets were down almost as far as the wood. And it really felt like you were dragging your fingers along the fingerboard itself. Now it feels really comfortable and quick to play. Beautiful sounding thing. I'm running it through my Lazy J 20 amp and I'm using a Strymon Flint for a touch of spring reverb. The strings on here are Diodario EPN 21s. They're 12 gauge pure nickel strings with a wound third. They sound really good on here, although I'll probably try some flat wounds next. I'm going to figure out what this guitar really likes string wise. So I hope you've enjoyed this bossa nova finger style lesson. That makes two bossa nova pieces we've covered now. This one in the more traditional Jobim style and the previous one more of a gypsy jazz style with the plectrum uh, and some strumming. That was the Bossa Dorado one. Do check that out if you've not seen it. So thanks so much for watching. Please do like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. All of those things make a huge difference to the visibility and the growth of this channel. And it really does mean a lot to me. I want to keep making these videos and I'm determined to see this place go from strength to strength. So again, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you next week for another lesson. Take care.